Uh, my name is Stephen Hollis. I'm, I'm an intellectual property uh, lawyer. I'm a partner at Adams and Adams Law Firm. I'm also a fellow of the Institute of Intellectual Property Lawyers. The, the Institute has 300 practicing of attorneys and other specialist practitioners of intellectual property law as its members. Uh, Mr. Chair, the, the Institute, as we understand the cases with all of the participants in these hearings, supports the much overdue reform of South Africa's copyright and performance rights legislation. Uh, the scale of the exercise uh, is notably vast. The application of copyright impacts on a broad range of commercially unrelated industries, some of which are shown on the screen here for illustration. Each industry sector and its subsectors depend on copyright in different ways to create opportunities for creators to thrive, thereby creating employment, at new investment and trade. Legal certainty, contractual flexibility and the freedom to trade in copyright works are vital components of an enabling legislative framework for copyright. Legislative intervention in one industry needs a solution that is not replicated without reason into other industries where the same problems do not exist. Exceptions to the exclusive rights and reversion rights must by the same token be applied to specific cases where the need for them exists to avoid unjustifiable expropriation of rights which could have constitutional implications or result in breaches of international treaties. The international treaties exist precisely so that the exclusive rights in the works of South African authors, composers, artists, uh, film producers and computer programmers are recognized internationally in all of the other treaty countries, just as the works of authors of treaty countries are recognized here. It's for this reason that all the treaties have this minimum standard, the so-called three-step test for member states to meet when they craft copyright exceptions for their internal needs. Mr. Chair, uh, I will not dwell much on the Institute's written submission today. The serious questions of the copyright bills, uh, constitutionality and, and treaty compliance issues uh, are presented in a format that I believe is easy to analyze in that document. Uh, we submit that both bills uh, suffer from material flaws to which quick fixes cannot be applied by the mere correction of wording. Even with the limited time allowed for in this consultation, the Institute's submission uh, raised, raises 19 sets of provisions of likely un constitutionality and non-compliance with the treaties, some having a broad ambit and some being very specific. And a word count of the Copyright Amendment Bill shows that these 19 sets of provisions affect up to 50% of the text that the bill pr proposes to introduce into the Copyright Act. It's very likely that the submissions uh, of other stakeholders here will show more. And even then, I would venture to say that that would not be the sum total of the constitutionality and treaty compliance problems. One has to remember that the bill that was originally introduced in May 2017 was an expropriative piece of legislation. The previous committee wrote out most of the egregious expropriative uh, provisions, but as the president's referral back has shown us, many expropriative provisions still remain and have the result that the bill does not improve the position of creators of copyright works as it was supposed to do. The Institute further submits that the National Assembly should not limit its reconsideration of a bill that is as controversial as the Copyright Amendment Bill to only the reservations raised by the President. We believe that this is not required uh, by, by Joint Rule 203. Rule 203 applied to the Portfolio Committee's deliberations on the President's referral decision. That process was concluded when the committee tabled its final report uh, which was adopted by the National Assembly. In concluding the Rule 203 process, the National Assembly agreed with the President's reservations, amongst others, that the bills require retagging and referred the bills back to the Portfolio Committee for its uh, consider further consideration. And now that the bills have been retagged as Section 76 bills, the restriction of scope no longer applies. All the flaws of the bills will be raised before the province 
provinces in the next part of the Section 76 process. And it therefore follows that all of those flaws, at the very least, those ones that have constitutional implications and international treaty non-compliance issues should be raised here too. Parliament's conduct in these uh, circumstances will be considered by the Constitutional Court if the bill is ultimately challenged, as appears from this judgment uh, by Judge Cameron in the lickable case uh, that is shown on screen. The Institute is aware of a number of documents that are being touted as research supporting the Copyright Amendment Bill. But having reviewed those documents, it's clear that they either predate the bill and therefore do not relate directly to its provisions, or that they are completely inadequate, like the DTI's unpublished SAIAS report. The bill was, has not benefited from an independent legal analysis or proper impact assessment. And therefore the Institute submits that the National Assembly should engage independent senior counsel who are experienced in constitutional law and intellectual property to prepare the comprehensive legal opinion that this consultation deserves if a decision is taken that the bill should be proceeded with. Submissions from interested parties in this round of hearings will not, in our view, provide a sufficient basis on which the Portfolio Committee could make an accurate assessment of the many legal questions uh, raised in the call for comments. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, with your permission, I'll now stop sharing the screen uh, and just conclude uh, with, with some more, a few comments. Thank you. So, We've, we've read with interest uh, a document uh, that was presented by an interest group uh, that was in, that's entitled the Joint Academic Opinion, uh, who will present after tea and some of the individual co-authors of that document uh, will present immediately after me and also tomorrow. We find the Joint Academic Opinion to be unpersuasive, not so much for what it says, but for what it does not say. On, on the issue of fair use, both the joint academic opinion and the October 2018 opinion by Dr. Schoenwetter to the previous committee skirt around the material differences between the fair use provisions in the USA and the new section 12A of the bill. The opinion claims that the differences substantially reflect South African case law and commentary, but then does not say how the bill's new factor of substitution effect that has never been raised in South African copyright law can be justified in place of the impact on the market requirement in US law. In arguing that the education exceptions are treaty compliant, the opinion World Intellectual Property and Buffalo Human Rights Law Review, and he concluded that the Convention's provisions are ineffective in helping developing countries. Why does this opinion not suggest how to make Schedule 2 compliant or suggest removing Schedule 2 because it's non-compliant and would be ineffective even if it were? And why does this opinion not even mention it at all? Mr. Chair, instead of legal analysis, the opinion and the writings of some of its co-authors repeatedly appeal to political sympathies uh, by linking the existing act to apartheid and discrimination and introduce every discussion on the bill with a claim that its new exceptions are, and I quote, reasonable, justifiable, and necessary and reflect those contained in many open and democratic societies around the world, unquote as a lead into an argument that any constitutional issues can be cured by the application of Section 36 of the Constitution. This line of argument is unpersuasive since it impliedly admits from the outset that provisions of the bill are indeed expropriated, but by not identifying which ones they are, they hide the constitutional flaws 
as if Section 36 can be used as a blanket to conceal them. The Copyright Act was introduced in 1978 to bring South African law up to date with the standard of copyright legislation in other common law countries at the time and to introduce the Stockholm text of the Berne Convention. The Stockholm text allows member states to legislate copyright exceptions along the flexible standards of the three-step test. Interestingly, the only provision to support apartheid institutions was a sanctions-busting provision in Section 45. The Institute contends that Section 45 is contrary to the WIPO Copyright Treaty and notes that it's not repealed by the bill, nor is it raised by any of the bill's supporters. Considering their argument, how can the authors of the joint academic opinion condone a provision that was meant to preserve the economy of a sanctioned regime and not even comment on it? All of this exposes its arguments in support of the bill as pure politicking and unhelpful for serious legal analysis. A number of the co-authors of this opinion, as well as some of the other persons who will be speaking for the bill in these hearings, Dr. Sean Wetter, Professor Ndube, uh, Professor Flynn, Ms. Nicholson, uh, they've all had preferential access to the previous portfolio committee with presentations made in December 2016, June 2017, and some of them, I believe, yesterday. Access that was, despite requests, not afforded to representatives of creators of copyright works or of the industries that rely on copyright. Now, those presentations spoke of copyright exceptions. These are the situations, as we know, where there's no permission uh, and no remuneration for copying or using a copyright protected work. They referred to it as users' rights, something that does not exist in South African law, but yet even found its way into the text of the Copyright Amendment Bill, the first draft. Exceptions are not described as a user's right in any legislation in the world, and fair use is not considered to be a user's right by the US courts. Indeed, an attempt to promote fair use as a user's right in Israel was rejected by its appeal court. We therefore question why these academics presented exceptions as users' rights in the first place. Uh, and they also made a, a host of unproven claims that broad copyright exceptions are good for economic development, a contention that has been seriously questioned, but in respect of which, unfortunately, there's to date been no government impact assessment as there should have been. Now, the same group of people, interestingly, reconsidered their strategy from around May 2018 and started claiming that the same copyright exceptions that they previously described as users' rights would now benefit recreators and creators of works. As UCT's uh, Professor Ngube, uh, who will be speaking tomorrow, said at a presentation for the American Research Libraries in September 2018, when she was asked about the narrative to convince South African lawmakers of the merit of the bill, uh, and I quote, there needed to be a, a readjustment of the narrative to focus perhaps more on creators rather than users, and also to convince society at large and policymakers that in fact all users are creators and vice versa. And so that if that is the narrative that you want to push, perhaps you don't want to latch onto a phrase that seems to generate some concerns. And so in our context, we moved away from our emphasis on user rights and started to be more inclusive and pay particular attention to the just cause of the struggling creative. And I think that has worked particularly well. End of quote. This change of strategy was developed by persons who claim academic independence and who have had privileged access to the legislative process at the expense of all other stakeholders. They, they expect that their contentions will be treated as independent academic opinion, while they actually unrelentingly canvass for the introduction of fair use in South Africa and all around the world, and for the bill to be passed with the least possible change at any cost. It's therefore not surprising that when their partisan contentions are presented as academic opinion, they are easily revealed as incomplete and legally unsound. I'm concluding now, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, I just want to reinforce here that the Institute is not opposed to the introduction of new exceptions. And the Institute, for example, recommends two small changes to the disability exception to enable it to pass muster. But the Institute is concerned with the rule of law not being followed in the passage of the bill. Hence the concerns about constitutionality and treaty compliance. 
It's therefore quite possible for a supporter of a fair use exception and exceptions to benefit education and persons with disabilities to oppose the bill for its many flaws. But what I've recounted here clearly underscores the case to have independent and experienced senior counsel undertake the required legal analysis and not to leave it only to the public participation process and to treat submissions that support the legal grounds for the bill in its current form with extreme care. I expect that last week's judgment uh, of the Canadian Supreme Court in uh, York University versus access copyright will be raised in these hearings. The independent legal study that the Institute recommends should take note that education in its own right is the subject of a fair dealing exception in Canada and that the Canadian Supreme Court has held there that exceptions are considered users rights. The same study should also take into account that Canada is alone in the world for having education as a subject of a fair dealing exception and that it has been objected to as being contrary to the three step test just as the Canadian Supreme Court is alone in the world by interpreting exceptions as rights of persons who reproduce copyright works without permission. This legal framework in Canada has in fact caused enormous personal loss to local authors whose works are reproduced in educational institutions in that country without remuneration. In conclusion, as, a, as an independent body of specialist practitioners of intellectual property law, the Institute foresees that persisting with the present copyright and performance protection amendment bills will only add more time to the 10 years that have already passed since the Copyright Review Commission submitted its very clear directions for the development of the law that will be at the expense of those who create copyright works for their living. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, very much uh, Mr. Hollis. Uh, any comments um, from members? If I can take uh, your hands and then we can actually then allow Mr. Stephen Hollis to conclude or okay. close up in terms of presentation, Secretary. Chairperson, I can't raise my hand. Okay. okay. Because, but my apologies to interject. However, I cannot raise my hand, and I'm not 100% sure why. Mm, no. Yeah. No, it's no, it. can, can we see how many hands do we have, Secretariat? We we have at the moment, with including Mr. Cuthbert, four hands: Ms. Dulani, Mr. Ernst Namashe, and Mr. Mulder, and Mr. Cuthbert's chair. Okay. In that order. Thank you, Chairperson. Let me take this opportunity to thank Ms. Halls. Uh, the only thing that I'm, I'm recording is that uh, he is very uh, clear what is presenting and what the, the suggestions we have noted. This is the way that uh, I'm happy about the public hearings, listening what we must do, what uh, we must uh, add what we must go and look at. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy about this presentation. We have noted, and as as a committee and uh, our legal uh, people, DTI, they will see what is it that uh, this Mr. Hall's uh, presentation want us to do. Thank you so much. Okay. The next one, uh, Secretariat. Mr. Burns Namashe, Chair. Burns Namashe. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, my, my take, Chair, is that, um, um, yes, um, we do hear about uh, these uh, uh, different uh, doctrines uh, that uh, the experts uh, would come up with, uh, whether it's uh, the analysis of fair use or, or three-step uh, doctrine and so on. Um, I Once again, uh, Chair, I really want to emphasize at uh, this point that uh, um, we, we would be more comfortable if uh, presenters could uh, use the better part of the time in zooming into uh, the specific areas that really would assist the committee in terms of its decision making process i i i must say uh, of course that uh, i think mr hollis uh, was very close into doing that and we must also appreciate the various options 
that he has put before the committee in terms of what needs to be done. And, and hopefully the submissions uh, that uh, uh, he has made would talk specifically to those constitutional areas that uh, I think he mentioned 19 of them, uh, where he is specifically saying uh, in this uh, section or clause, uh, this is the constitutional, or this is the matter that may not pass the constitutional master. Uh, those are the contributions that we think will be uh, helpful. Because at the end of the day, we must be able to come up with a bill that must pass the constitutional master with a process that must ultimately uh, translate into a legislation uh, rather than Thank engaging in, in an academic, winded academic exercise. Thank you very much. The next member, Secretary. Chair is Mr. Mulder, Chair. Honorable Mulder. Thank you, Chair. Now I'll be short again. I also wish to thank Mr. Stephen Hollis for his well-founded presentation of the uh, Institute. And um, yes, uh, just to echo then the previous representer as well, I would also support the, the recommendation for the National Assembly to engage further uh, with experienced constitutional law and intellectual property experts for a legal opinion um, so that it be referred back to DTIC. Thank you, Chair. The, the next one, Honorable uh, Secretary. It's Mr. Cuthbert, Chair. Honorable Cuthbert. Thank you, Chairperson. I'm not sure uh, whether I've been granted certain rights on the Zoom platform or, you know, taken, they haven't had them taken away, so I can't raise my hand, but if you can please just get that issue sorted out. Um, just in regard to Mr. Hollis's presentation to the committee, he makes a contention about the academics um, that, you know, one, one of which actually presented to us yesterday in a workshop. And that kind of makes me think that, you know, the committee has been guided in a particular way to obviously intend a certain outcome, which I think we've heard from both of the speakers thus far. And what I would like to understand is two things. Firstly, uh, you know, what considerations uh, were taken into account when the people who came to brief us um, on, you know, copyright law legislation as what well, in the broader sense, as well as this particular bill, um, you know, how were they chosen and, you know, what was the thinking behind it? And was this opportunity then opened up, you know, to other academics and practitioners of the sort? Because I think that, you know, if we've got uh, people who are coming to brief us who have been canvassing uh, particular lines of argument overseas as well as locally, then that kind of skews the process in many respects. Um, and then the second issue that I would also like to, to raise, uh, Chairperson, regarding, uh, you know, Mr. Hollis's input is, you know, whether or not he believes that uh, you know, we should similarly follow like Mr. Uh, the, the first presenter that we should rather scrap the bill entirely and then we should allow for a, a continued uh, review process to take place and that, you know, only particular sections of the, the, the existing legislation should be amended because that's kind of the, the impression that I got. So if you could just clarify on that. Secretary, the next one. Chair President. Uh... Chair? Yes. I, that's the only hands that I've seen, Chair, but I don't know who is speaking because I don't see... My thing was it. It's my thing was it. My head has been up there for... Okay. <laughs> no, it's my thing was it. We actually see that, uh, let, Let's actually check uh, if ever there's any further hands. My thing was it. You take your, your opportunity. Uh, Secretary, let's check if ever there's any other member. My thing was it. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh... I would love also to, um, you know, uh, uh, accept the the the, um, the presentation by Mr. Hollis, uh, Chairperson. Nevertheless, I would I would like to concur with the Honourable Namasha that the speakers from the academic personnel should come up with solutions more than lambasting what it, what has been happening, and um, and Chairperson, you know, it couldn't be right for the speakers to throw the bill away. Uh, I think we we're all here to 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 make uh, you know the bill to work for for South Africans and everyone and for the for the creatives and everything. Thank you, Chairperson. Secretary, I have not seen any other hand, Chair. 
Okay, Let, let's go back to uh, Mr. Hollis, because I think on our part is just those comments, and then we're just going to allow you, Mr. Hollis, just for your concluding remark, because obviously I think uh, in terms of your input, one actually think uh, that's the kind of uh, understanding of members in terms of your contribution, which we appreciate very much. Can you actually get your concluding remarks, uh, Mr. Hollis? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the honorable members for the, for the questions and the comments. Um, so first of all, uh, we certainly do set out all of the, uh, the constitutional concerns uh, that we didn't have enough time in this short uh, presentation to go into detail, but they are confined or reflected in clear detail in respect of the copyright amendment bill. Um, in our written submission, I, I would encourage committee members who haven't had an opportunity to consider that yet to, uh, to, to have a look. Um, the, what is very important uh, to consider is there's a number of legal uh, of, uh, solu potential legal solutions going forward. It's not just a case of, of, uh, of throwing the ball uh, you know, out. Um, although a redrafting from scratch, uh, because of the many fundamental problems, is certainly an option that one should consider in the broader picture, as uh, the previous speaker uh, mentioned. Uh, but the committee does have other options. The Institute avails itself to, uh, to engage with the committee and to discuss potential other legal issues. I won't go into, into it in detail now because we just don't have the time, but um, there, there are certain measures that can be considered. But the first step, is as I mentioned in this presentation, is to make sure that there's a proper legal, independent legal analysis and an impact assessment done on the bills as they are with us. Let's forget how they got here. Let's do that uh, uh, legal analysis because in effect, what the committee has called on the public to do is to produce the missing research that the DTI has failed to, to present previously. Now I'm not uh, uh, throwing stones back at the DTI. I'm just saying factually that's where we are. That's why it's very difficult in this consultation to speak only moving forward without recognizing the mistakes were made. But I think we'll all stand shoulder to shoulder in recognizing that there is a way forward. But the first step would be to determine whether these bills, the big question is, are these bills actually achieving the valuable uh, policy objectives as set out in the in the uh, object of, of memor the memorandum of the bills. Now, now, one cannot do that without the proper assessments. And when I say assessment, when I say independent legal assessment, what's required is that each new provision, each new proposal, each new limitation of rights, each new copyright exception, has to be weighed up against the international treaties, the burn three step test to see. Does this one comply, yes or no? Does this one comply, yes or no? And here are the legal reasons. Then each of those provisions should be subjected to an economic impact assessment. You remember that slide that I put up at the beginning that showed all the different industries? It shows what a, a complex of, of, of matter this is because one has to bear in mind that a solution for the music industry uh, might cause, if you copy and paste that solution to another industry, can actually cause massive harm in that industry. And we should, when developing these laws, also consider that it's not just a localized issue. The, uh, South Africa is actually participating within a highly competitive global marketplace. And before major investors into creative industries, entertainment industries, feature film production, computer and software program development, select South Africa as a destination to create employment and new opportunities for our creatives, they look at the underlying legislative framework. And we've got a lot of pr proposals in the bill uh, especially the Copyright Amendment Bill, that actually apply indiscriminately across all of the, uh, the industries. There's, there's a particularly nasty provision called the Contract Override Provision in Section 39B, which severely impacts on the freedom to trade in, in copyright-related works and productions uh, without, without a clear policy objective. Now, the thing is, while some of these rights do exist in other jurisdictions, so for instance, uh, there are instances where there's, there's a contract override that says you can't contract out of this scenario. But you'll see when you find them in other laws, for instance, in the UK, 
They apply to very specific uh, uh, circumstances, not indiscriminately across all uh, ranges of works and industries uh, uh, and copyright industries. And that is a, a massive problem for the bill. Now, the, the way forward is to identify which, the, which provisions require amendment. It requires that analysis uh, in respect of not only the international treaties, but also the constitution. And these are highly complex areas of the law, and that's why the, the Institute recommends uh, that consideration be given to engaging a senior counsel or counsels who are highly experienced in those fields to prepare this legal opinion that, in effect, this call for comments has, is calling for to say, does this comply with the Constitution and does it comply with uh, international treaties? With respect, it, uh, it's very difficult for members of the public and for people in business to actually advise on these uh, on these legal issues. Um, but moving forward, there's a number of... If you uh, can round up in a minute. <laughs> yes, I can, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, there are uh, progressive solutions one could consider. For instance, the performance bill does not suffer from the, the same amount of uh, constitutional defects as a copyright uh, amendment bill. With the right people, with the right experts uh, assembled, uh, it is possible, I believe, to attend to an uncoupling of the performance bill so that that bill can be passed quicker. It does require a few critical amendments, especially insofar as the unification of rights in, in, in producers of audiovisual works are concerned, for instance, but it can be done. And then for, uh, for the copyright bill to be worked on, and even there, there, there's potentially an option to actually pass some of the rights that can immediately go through. For instance, the new digital rights to introduce them. The Marrakesh Treaty uh, compliance uh, provisions for, for the dis uh, people with disabilities, uh, rights that are not contentious that can actually go through. I think it might be possible for the portfolio committee uh, to, uh, to work on a, let's call it a stripped down version of the bill, uh, as was done in the national, I believe it was done in the National Credit Amendments uh, Act, and to refer some of the issues of great contention to, uh, for further impact assessment and legal analysis. Uh, but I'm happy to engage, the Institute is happy to engage with the committee. Uh, you know where to find us. And we're happy to discuss uh, any of these potential legal solutions to the problem to make sure we get these bills back on track uh, and headed in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hollis. Most appreciated. Uh, I think, um, let's say we, we do stay in contact because you've actually been interacting through this process. There may be issues that may have to be followed through, but thanks very much for the time and the presentation. Most appreciated. Can we then move on, Secretary, to the next uh, presentation?